Church, we are so glad that you are with us today. Listen, no matter where you're at, we'd love to have you jump in with us. We're going to praise and we're going to sing to God together. So come on, let's get started. Let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. And we sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. And we sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it rise. Down every wall, we'll watch the giants fall. Oh, fear cannot survive when we press right. The God of breakthroughs on our side, forever lifts him high. With all creation, cry, God, we praise you. Oh, we praise you. Oh, come on, we sing that faith. The song that overcomes the rage and sea. Let faith be the song that calms the storm inside of me. We sing, let it rise. Let faith arise. Come on, sing it out. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Oh, fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side Forever lift your mind With all creation cry God we praise you Oh We praise you Oh Come on This is what living looks like This is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise. Keep singing it. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. Come on. This is what heaven sounds like. We That's praise it. You got it. Come on. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise. We'll see you break down every wall We'll watch the giants fall Well, fear cannot survive when we get yes, The God of breakthroughs on our side Forever lifts your mind With all creation cry, God, we praise you
So a few weeks ago, I cut a guy off in the drive through lane at Starbucks. And I'm looking in my rearview mirror and he looks like he's had a really bad day and his car looks like it's had some really bad weeks. And I felt a stirring from the spirit to pay for his drive through order. Uh, maybe it was a stirring in the spirit, maybe it was guilt. Anyway, I did pay for his drive through order and I felt really good. And it reminded me that I want to be a part of good. You see, when we focus on God and His call for us to live generous lives as Christ followers, we're a part of the good that He is doing in the world. Now, giving is a personal thing between you and God, and it's part of your worship expression. If you want to give today, there's a link on the screen, and you can do so online. When we focus on God, I found, when I focus on God, generosity is often the result. This is the last week you can get signed up for the next session of Rooted. It kicks off this Thursday night. And uh, Rooted, I know it's this thing we talk about all the time here, and it's because it's awesome. Every time I go through Rooted, God has something for me in the experience. And it's a great way for you to get connected to people in a time when I think we all really feel the need for that. So you can sign up online today. Don't miss it. Hey, what's going on, LifeBridge? On September 20th, that Sunday night, we are going to have another night of worship and prayer in our parking lot. If you were at this a few weeks ago, it was fantastic. There were so many of you here. It was such an awesome time where we got to connect, hang out together, get to see people that we haven't seen in a while, and just get after it together and worship. So we're gonna do it again Sunday night, uh, September 20th. We're gonna start at six o'clock for worship, but once again, we're gonna have food trucks in the parking lot starting at five. Let me go ahead and encourage you to get here early, get a good spot. We had far more cars than we anticipated last time. Get here early, get your spot, get some food, see some people, and then we're gonna start worship at six o'clock. I will see you then Sunday night, September 20th. Help me spread the word, invite people, invite people in our church, your neighbors, your friends. It is going to be an awesome night. I will see you guys there. We're never closer to the heart of God than when we serve. And we're never closer to each other than when we serve together, socially distanced, of course. One of the values of LifeBridge has always been serving. And so we've got a serve day coming up on September 19th, and we want you to be a part of it. There are a whole bunch of projects you can choose from to engage in that serve day. They're online, there's a link on the screen, you can sign up there too. And if you're unable to leave your home, you can join us just by being on the prayer team for that day. But we would love you to join us to serve, to reflect the heart of the Father. Meanwhile, right now, we're going to learn more Red Sea rules from Matt as he digs in to God's Word. Who or what do you want fighting for you? Now, I know that might sound like a random question. It might even be a little bit dramatic, but just think about it for a second. Who or what do you want fighting for you? Have you ever been to an air show or seen a flyover? I mean, I love those. Maybe you got to see the, the Thunderbirds or the Blue Angels at a, at a demonstration or some kind of flyover. And every time I get to see one of those, I'm just in awe. It, it's awesome to see what those fighter jets are capable of doing. You know, the speed, the maneuvers, the firepower, how loud they are. I mean, wherever you're at, say it with me right now. Say it with me. I feel the need, the need. There's all my Top Gun fans. Man, I just, every time I get to see one of those, I have the, the same initial first thought. I'm really glad those guys are on our side. I'm really glad they're fighting for us. I, I wouldn't want to be on the wrong end of one of those fighter jets because whoever or whatever is on the wrong end of one of those things is going to lose. I'm, I'm so glad they're on our side. I'm so glad they're fighting for us. So let me ask you that question again. Be, besides an F-18 or an F-16, who or what do you want fighting for you? Now, I don't have to tell you this, but there are going to be fights that we are going to encounter throughout life. That, that's inevitable. I mean, life is not a cakewalk where there is nothing but rainbows and butterflies, where conflict is a myth and, and pain is only an accident. Uh, that's, just, that's just not true. Like, we're going to encounter fights. We see fighting all the time today. We see foolish fighting. Kids fighting on the playground, people fighting on social media, that's you, stop it. People burning stuff down in the streets, just foolish kinds of fighting. But then there are other fights, you know, fighting for justice, or 
wars against tyranny, fighting for the oppressed. Those kind of fights cannot and should not be avoided, but there's something so much deeper than the, than the surface level. There's something so much deeper going on. The, the conflict, the division, the violence, the fighting, there is much more to it than we see on the surface. Ephesians 6.12 says this, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. There is a war that is constantly going on, and, and there is a spiritual army that is trying to steal, kill, and destroy. And we can see the effects of that army. We can see the tangible effects of that army just by looking at all the evil in our world today. Now, no matter where you're at, whatever you believe, whether you believe what I just said, you believe Ephesians 6, or you think what I just said is flat out crazy, no matter where you're at, you and I both, we can sense this spiritual battle if we really stop and pay attention. Like something is, something's off. So let me go back to my original question one more time. Who do you want fighting for you? Now, while we try to answer that for ourselves, I, I think it's important for us to understand what will and what won't fight for us. I mean, just like the Blue Angels or the Thunderbirds, who's really on our side? Now, there's this declaration throughout the Bible that says God will fight for his people. It's all over the place. Examples like Nehemiah 4.20, it says our God will fight for us. Exodus 14, 14 that we hit two weeks ago says the Lord himself will fight for you. I mean, that, that's awesome. God will fight for you. That's great. But what about right now? You know, whenever somebody tells you, hey, I'm going to do something for you in the future. I mean, that's cool. Thanks for telling me that. I mean, when, when things are rough for you, when you seem trapped, when you don't know what to do, when you need help, when you're being attacked, when that happens to you, I want you to know that I will have your back. I will help you. I will stay with you. I will be loyal to you. I will fight for you. I mean, that's great. Thanks. I'm glad that you will do that for me in the future. But I mean, what about right now? I need you to make good on that promise right now. Here's the thing. Future promises that are in the present, you know, somebody saying, hey, I, I will do that for you in the future. That's great. Only if it's been substantiated by what's been going on in the past. Are you tracking with me? If somebody says that they're going to do something for you in the future, you can believe that and hold on to that promise right now in the present if they've done that before in the past, if they've made good on their word. Exodus 14, 14, God says, I will fight for you. And then he makes good on that promise. So the Egyptian army is right behind the Israelites. They're about to kill them. The Israelites are trapped. They've got no way out. There's nothing they can do. And then God makes a way when there's not a way. They, with their own eyes, they see him part the Red Sea, this massive body of water as they're walking toward it, not knowing what's going to happen, not knowing, hey, what's God doing? Why did he tell us to move forward? And then he just parts the Red Sea. And they walk through it with these just giant walls of water on each side of them. I mean, just, just imagine how that would have been. Try, try to put yourself in that spot. I mean, you think that you're going to die. You think this is it. I mean, this is, this is it. And then all of a sudden, a few minutes later, you're walking through this tunnel through the middle of the Red Sea, except there is no tunnel. There, there are just walls of water on each side of you. But God didn't only make an escape route. That's, that's not the only thing that he did. He also fought for his people because this Egyptian army that wanted to kill the Israelites... They weren't done yet. So let's pick it up there. We're going to pick it up in verse 23 of Exodus 14. Then the Egyptians, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and charioteers, chased them into the middle of the sea. But just before dawn, the Lord looked down on the Egyptian army from the pillar of fire and cloud, and he threw their forces into total confusion. He twisted the chariot wheels, making their chariots difficult to drive. Let's get out of here, away from these Israelites, the Egyptians shouted. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. When all the Israelites had reached the other side, the Lord said to Moses, Moses, raise up your hand over the sea again. Then the waters will rush back and cover the Egyptians and their chariots and their charioteers. So as the sun began to rise, Moses raised his hand over the sea and the water rushed back into its usual place. The Egyptians tried to escape, but the Lord swept them into the sea. Then the waters returned and covered all of the chariots and all of the charioteers and the entire army of Pharaoh. 
of all the Egyptians who had chased the Israelites into the sea, not a single one survived. Okay, don't ignore what just happened. And don't dismiss it either. An entire army was just wiped out. I mean, how many thousands of people were killed? And at the exact same time, an entire people were protected. How many people were saved? I mean, why would God do this? I mean, why would he wipe out and kill all of the Egyptians? I mean, that just, if, if, if God's a God of love and mercy and grace, if that's what he's about, this, this doesn't seem very loving. Why would, why would God do this to the Egyptians? You know, maybe you've, you've heard a question like that before. It gets asked from time to time. Maybe, maybe you've had a friend say that or a coworker. If you've read that in, in an interview. You know, why would a loving God do something like this? You know, maybe you're asking that question right now. Maybe you're trying to reconcile that. I mean, if God is a merciful God like he claims to be, then why would he wipe out an entire army like he just did? You know, if, if, if this is a religion that's about love, why would it worship a God that would do something like that to the Egyptians? I mean, if you're asking those questions or you have that skepticism, good. Because that can lead you to understanding something about God's character. So let's just boil all, of the, all of those questions around this subject. Let, let's boil them all down, the skepticism, down to this. How can a loving God do something like that? Like, how can a loving God do something that, that we just read about? Don't shy away from tough questions like this, either from asking them or, or trying to understand them. The problem we have when trying to understand a tough question like this is that we don't know what the word love means anymore. I mean, we think we do. We, we think we know a lot about love, but love has become a junk drawer word in our culture because it gets thrown around all the time. We throw it around for so many different reasons about so many different people or so many different occasions. We just throw it all over the place to the point where the definition of love in our culture has become muddied. It, it's confused. It, it's baseless. We don't know what it means. So love has become a throwaway word. And the reason I know that's true is because you can say that you love your spouse and you love tacos in the same sentence. That's kind of confusing. I mean, those are both great things, but do, do you love your spouse the way you love tacos? I, that's kind of weird. Or, you know, you love the Broncos and you love Jesus. Or you love the fall in the mountains or, and you love yoga at the same time. W what we do is we attach the word love to anything that makes us feel good. It's the word that we use to show uh, enjoyment or admiration or that we, we take pleasure in something. It's it's. We feel good about this, so we say we love it. Oh, I love this thing over here. I love those people over there. I love doing this. I love that thing over there. We just attach it to anything that makes us feel good. But that's not what it is. I mean, usually when we say we love something or someone, that, that's a good thing. It's, it's showing that we like it and enjoy it. That's a great thing. But if that's what we believe love is, if that's the definition of love, then we're going to struggle whenever we experience something that doesn't make us feel good. And there are plenty of things that don't make us feel good, but are good for us. Here's the truth about love. Love is not a feeling. It's not. Love is not a feeling. Love is a choice. Love is an action. When Jesus said, I want you to love your neighbor as yourself, when he used the word love there, he didn't mean it the same way when you say, I love tacos. And for the record, I'm all in on tacos. All in on tacos. But when Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, he, he didn't mean, I want you to feel good about your neighbor. I want you to have good vibes about them. I want you to think well of them. I want you to enjoy them. That's not what he meant when he said, I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. He said, I want you to serve them. That's what it means. I want you to self-sacrifice for them. I want you to take care of them. Love is never about getting. Love is never about taking in. It's not selfish. It's about giving. It's about giving away. It's about self-sacrifice. It's about action. Until there's action, we're not talking about love. We're talking about emotion. There's nothing wrong with emotion. We, we, need, we experience emotions, and there's, those are great things. Those are gifts from God. But we cannot confuse love with emotion. Love is not love until it's put into action. And this is the part of the story that, that I know can be hard for us to wrap our minds around, but this part of the story doesn't contradict God's love it actually validates it. Well, 
wait, what are you talking about? It validates it. He just wiped out an entire army by having them swept into the sea. That, that doesn't seem very loving to me. That, that's violent. That seems like hate, Matt. What are you talking about? Let me try to illustrate it this way. Uh, I'm a dad. I've got three young kids. Um, uh, my kids bring me great joy. I am proud of them. They make me laugh. They make me want to pull my hair out at times. My kids aren't perfect at all. They'll, they'll never be perfect. But they're my kids. And I'm their daddy. So if anyone messes with my kids, or if anyone tries to hurt my kids, I'm going to come after them. I'm going to protect my kids, even violently if I have to. They're going to experience my wrath. That person's going to experience my wrath that tries to hurt my kids. Now, that's not out of hate. I don't hate that person. That wrath isn't coming from my hate. In fact, what it is, that wrath is coming from my love for my kids. That's a way that I put my love into action. Just like when I, when I provide for my kids or teach them or discipline them or encourage them, protecting them or fighting for them is another way to put my love into action for them. And that's exactly what God is doing here. He's putting his love into action. He's fighting for his sons and daughters. He's not saying, I hate you to the Egyptians, even though they're experiencing his wrath. What he's actually doing is he's saying, I love you to the Israelites by fighting for them and then making good on that promise. That's what's going on here. Okay, okay, I get fighting for your kids. That makes sense. But, but what about the Egyptians here? I mean, what, what, what about them? I mean, if God has love for everybody, why is he leaving them out here? Yeah, God is a God of love. Absolutely, he's a God of love. But he's also a God of justice. And God, if he is not a God of justice, then he's not a God of love. I was in Kenya in 2014, and we were touring one of the most impoverished slums in the world. I mean, this place, this slum is massive, and the poverty level is so awful. I, I can't even begin to describe to you how bad this place is. And it only continues to get worse with corruption. And the first day we were there, we were taking a tour of the slum and we stopped outside of this one particular shanty and, and started talking to one of the young mothers that, that lived there. And she said something that still messes with me today. She was talking about how the worst nights in this slum are the nights when it rains. So I asked her why, you know, why, why are those the worst nights? And she went on to explain that most of the, the shanties in this slum were made with tin roofs, tin, T-I-N, they have tin roofs. So on the nights when it would rain, the rain hitting those tin roofs was so loud, it would cover up the screams of the women that were being assaulted on those nights. And then she said this, she says, I, I cannot believe in a God that is not a God of wrath. That's what she said. She said, because of this injustice, I cannot believe in a God that is not a God of wrath. A lot of times we don't think that way. God is a God of justice and wrath. And that validates his love. Those things aren't opposed to each other. They're not. In fact, you cannot separate those two from each other. God is also patient. He's a patient God. The Egyptians had 400 years. They had 400 years to turn to God. And they got 10 eye-opening plagues to, to grab their attention before they ever got to the Red Sea. 2 Peter 3 says this, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise. His promise to bring justice, his promise for wrath, that it'll, his wrath will be fulfilled. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but he is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish. That means he didn't wish for the Egyptians to perish either. Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God's patience is another way that he puts his love into action. The Egyptians got 400 years of patience. That was love in action. And then God fought for the Israelites at the Red Sea. That was love put into action also, even though it was violent. But this wasn't the most violent act of love we've ever seen. Not, not even close. The most violent display of love that we have ever seen, that the world has ever seen, was the cross. 
Like at the cross is where God's love and God's wrath were on full display. No, no other time have we seen God's love more intense and God's wrath more intense than at the cross. Jesus took on the sin of the world, took on God's wrath and God's justice, paid for the sin by dying a gruesome, horrific death that he didn't deserve. That makes the cross the greatest act of love the world has ever seen. Like there's a, there's a penalty attached to my sin and to your sin, a, a penalty that we cannot pay for. Justice is going to be served, and it was at the cross. Jesus says, I'll take it on my own. I'll take on God's wrath. I'll pay for it. I will serve justice by taking on this death myself. That horrific, violent, undeserved death was the greatest act of love we have ever seen and we will ever see. God fought for his people at the Red Sea just like he promised and then God, once again, Jesus, fought for you at the cross just like he promised. So right now, do, do you need somebody to fight for you? Do, do you feel like you're being chased down? Maybe you feel trapped or you don't see how you're going to get out of this current situation that you find yourself in. You don't, you don't know what's next. Do you, do you just need someone to fight for you right now? Man, I have really, really good news for you. The God of the universe, the God that created you, the God that created everything that we see, the one true God fought and died for you and will fight for you right now. Know that because Jesus fought for you on the cross, he will fight for you today. Jesus dying for you, fighting for you on the cross proves to you that he'll fight for you today. You just got to let him. The people got to see, God's people, the Israelites, they got to see God's power to free them. Now they just saw God's power to save them. What do you think that did to them? I mean, can, can you imagine what that would, that would have done to them to see God do that for them? Psalm 106 is a song written about one of the things that happened at the Red Sea. It's a reminder for the people of Israel. Here's what God did at the Red Sea, and here's what God will still do. L listen to this. This is verse 11 of, of Psalm 106. Then the water returned and covered their enemies, the Egyptians. Then the water returned and covered their enemies. Not one of them survived. Then his people believed his promise. That's key. Then his people believed his promise. Love put into action. Love put into action causes people to believe that it's real. Man, I can't state that enough. When you see love put into action, it will cause you to believe that it's real. That's why the Israelites believed God. That's why Psalm 106 says they believed because they saw God's love in action. They saw God fight for him. And the same thing is true for you. People will believe you when they see you act. When they see you act in love, you say you love this or you love this person. When you act on it, people will believe that your love is real. If you say that you love Jesus, are you acting on that right now? When people say that they love you to you or that they love something else and you, you hear them say that, when they act on that in a loving way, that authenticates that love, that authenticates their loyalty, their faithfulness. People believed God when he acted. People will believe you when you say you love them or you say you love Jesus or you say you love the church. They'll believe you when you act on it. Are you acting on it? For you today, right now, you will believe you will believe that Jesus saves you when you look and see what he did for you on the cross. When you look at the cross and see how Jesus acted and how he saved you there, you'll believe. So maybe that's a step for you right now. Maybe it's a simple prayer right now. Let me give you a simple thing to pray. Just ask Jesus. This is all it is. Ask Jesus, hey Jesus, show me how you saved me on the cross. Show me how you saved me on the cross. Show me how you fought for me. Show me how you're still fighting for me. And Jesus fought for you on the cross and he will fight for you today. You just have to let him. And here's the thing. Everybody has someone or something fighting for them. Everybody does. It's your choice. Here, here's what I mean. The Egyptians lost this battle in a really bad way. I mean, they lost really badly. But they had somebody or something that was fighting for them. At least they thought so. The Egyptians were a very polytheistic culture. They, they worshipped all kinds of false gods. And they believed that these false gods would care for them and provide them and protect them and fight for them. The problem is false gods can't fight for you. False gods can't fight for you. And they learned this firsthand. God was getting his glory by fighting at the Red Sea. He was putting his love into action. But another reason that he was fighting at the Red Sea was so that people would know so that there would be 
no shadow of a doubt that there is a God, a one true God, and he is the God that is fighting right now. Not a God that can be conjured up by man's imagination or made by human hands. No, there's one true God, it's the God of the Bible. He's fighting at the Red Sea to prove that and to expose all the other false gods. Uh, a God that is created in someone's mind and then carved or crafted by human hands cannot fight for you. The Egyptians' false gods, they, they couldn't protect them or provide for them or care for them. Those false gods couldn't fight for them. And it's very easy for us to look back on that, to look back on a polytheistic culture like the Egyptians and, and say, really? Like, really? Maybe we even look down on it cond condescendingly, like you thought that that false god that you created in your mind and then you carved into an image of, of wood or stone, you thought that god would fight for you? Like, really? I mean, we, we, are, we are way too educated for that. We are way too enlightened for that. We have way too much logic or reason to fall into that trap. It's really easy to think that. But we live in just as much of a polytheistic culture as the Egyptians did. We have false gods all over the place. All over the place. The false god of fame. The false god of financial security. The false god of success, the false god of status, the false god of politics, the false god of postmodern thinking. I mean, I can keep going on and on and on. We have false gods all over the place. We just don't normally carve them into a wooden or stone image. So here's what I'm getting at. Every single one of us has someone or something fighting for them. My question to you is, who's fighting for you? Who's fighting for you? Is it yourself? The false god of self-pride. I mean, I got this. I don't need anybody, anybody's help. I don't need anybody to fight for me. Is it your career? The false god of success? Like, I mean, if I just get to this level of my career, I, I know I can have this level of success, which will provide for me, and I'll be set at that point. Is that what's fighting for you? How about your boss? Is your boss fighting for you? How's that going? What about politics? The false god of politics. You know, if, if only this candidate will get elected, they'll fight for me and then everything will be good. If you believe that, I, I don't want to be around you on November 3rd. Honestly, right now, like who or what is fighting for you? Is it, is it a false God? And can I tell you what false God I let fight for me at times? If I'm not careful, it's comfort. I mean, I'll give in to the false God of comfort all the time. Like, oh man, if, if, if I'm just comfortable, then I'm winning. That, that becomes the end goal for me if I'm not careful. It's just, so, just to make sure that I'm comfortable. And that's a false God. I think that's a massive false God in, in, in our culture. I mean, just do an honest assessment. Is there a false God that you've created or a false God that you've adopted from somewhere that you think is fighting for you? And if that's the case... It's only going to fail you, and it's only going to leave you in a worse spot than you're currently in. Example, the Egyptians. Or is Jesus fighting for you? Are you letting him fight your battles? The God that fought for you at the Red Sea, the God that fought for you on the cross, the God that still fights for you today, if you follow him forward in faith. So what's your next step with all this? Maybe it's to let go of a false God. You know, do a deep dive into you. See if there really is a, a false God that you're holding on to and just let go of it. Maybe that's your next step. Maybe your next step is to let Jesus fight for you. Maybe your next step is to let Jesus be your Lord and Savior. I want to I accept Christ. I wanna, Jesus, I want to accept you as my Lord and Savior. I want you to fight for me now just like you did for me on the cross. Thank you for that. Maybe your next step is to get baptized. Okay, I've accepted Christ. I want, I want to get baptized. I want to take that step. Or maybe you've had a relationship with Christ for a long time, but, but you've never been baptized by immersion. And that's your next step. It's never too late for that to be your next step. I mean, whatever your next step is, there's a number on the bottom of your screen right now that you can text if, if you want to accept Christ, if you want to get baptized, if you want someone to, to pray for you or pray with you, text that number right now and one of our team members will, will get back to you right now. I mean, what's your next step? We've got to remember that as we take our next step as individuals and, and as a church, we've got to remember that our God fought for us on the cross and he'll keep fighting for us today. That this God, Jesus, that he wants to fight for you. That he loves you as a son or daughter. That he wants you to know him more. We've got to have the courage and faith to, to follow him forward and let him fight for us, not some false God. So I want to ask you that, that same question one more time. 
Who's fighting for you right now? Who do you want fighting for you right now? Let me pray for us. Jesus, it's so easy for us to get scared. It's so easy for us to not know what to do or to try to fight our own battles or, or try to lean on a false God that we don't even realize is a false God. There's so many of them today. But I ask that you would make it real to every single one of us, especially there's somebody right now that really needs to hear this. Make it, make it real to them that you fought and died for them specifically on the cross and that you're doing that today. I pray that you would open their heart to that, that people would accept your truth, that they would accept your grace, that they would accept your power to fight for them right now, us as a church, me as an individual. Help us to have faith to follow you. Thank you that you're a God that fights out of love. We love you. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. That was a great message. We're being reminded that God showed up in a big way for his people, removed huge obstacles, defeated their enemies. How do you need God to show up in your life this week? You know, I've been learning to pray the prayer that never fails when it comes to situations in my life. God, your will be done. Your plan, not my plan. Your perspective, not my perspective. I'm so grateful that part of God's plan and His will was for Him to send His Son to die on a cross for us, to rise again to new life, removing the biggest obstacle of all in our lives that was sin so that we could have a relationship with our Lord eternally. And so let's take some time right now, if possible, or sometime today to take communion and remember Christ's sacrifice. You can do that with a piece of bread or a cracker representing his broken body for you. You can do that with a, a cup of juice representing his shed blood for you, setting you free, allowing us to be in relationship. And if you're not ready in your journey yet to take communion, just take some time today to reflect on what you're learning about how much God loves you. I'm so grateful for his sacrifice for the fact that it means that I can watch Him move in my life again and again and again. Let's tune in to how He's moving this week.